so we are still in the Gospel of John, chapter 5. And pop quiz, who remembers what happened last week? So those of you who took notes, you may cheat and look back at the last page. What, what was going on last week in John chapter 5? Jesus was healing a man. Jesus healed a man. The Sabbath. On the Sabbath. What a bad guy. <laughs> healing on the Sabbath? And, and this man, how long had he been an invalid? 38 years. 38 years lame. And where did Jesus find him? At the pool of Bethesda. At the pool of Bethesda. So here's our pool. And around the pool were these colonnades, basically shaded structures. Um, there's five of them. I'm going to draw two. And he's laying here on his mat like this. And Jesus comes up to him and asks him a silly question. And what was that question? Do you want to be healed? Do you want to be healed? And the man's answer is, is obviously, yes, I want to be healed. But he says, I can't get down into the water. And if we remember, there was this, um, this supernatural occurrence that happened here uh, with respect to the water. And it may not be in your translation. You may have to look at the footnote. But it, from time to time, an angel of the Lord would come down and stir up the water, and whoever made it in first would be healed of whatever disease or um, problem that he had. And so he's lame. He can't get down there, and there's nobody to help him. And so Jesus just looks at him and says, um, he says, get up, take up your bed, and walk. And that's what the man does. He hops up. He's been lame 38 years. He hops up, rolls up his mat, sticks it under his arm, and starts walking off. And it's the Sabbath day. And people immediately take notice. And so he's approached by some of the religious leaders in the area. And they say, look, guy, you're carrying your mat. We consider that to be work. That's not allowed on the Sabbath. You need to stop doing that. And he goes, well, but that guy who healed me, he healed me and he told me to take up my bed and walk. Now, how did they feel about that response? What, what were they concerned about? What did they, what did they want to know? Who is this guy? Mm -hmm. Who's this guy? Not that healed you. Who's the guy that told you to take up your bed and walk on the Sabbath? And so he doesn't know. Later, Jesus comes and finds him in the temple. He's gone, he's gone like pretty much straight to the temple to give praises and thanksgiving to God for the healing that's just occurred in his life. And Jesus finds him and says, look, now you're well, go and sin no more. And he, and basically, and tells the guy that his name's Jesus, I guess, because now he knows his name is Jesus. And he goes to, back to the Jews and tells them, and now they're mad at Jesus. And why are they mad at Jesus? Now, Matt, you said this up here at the, at the beginning, that he healed on the Sabbath, but it was a little more than that. It was that he told the man to do work on the Sabbath, that he had to take up your mat and walk. And so you'll see um, a phrase that's used, and especially in a lot of older writings, um, not like Bible old writings, but uh, I'm talking like Reformation era writings. You'll hear this phrase, Sabbath breaking. Um, like if you read uh, about John Bunyan, John Bunyan was the writer of Pilgrim's Progress, and he was saved as a grown man. And he said before that, he was a champion Sabbath breaker, like that's the thing that God convicted him of um, when he was brought to Christ. And so they're mad at Jesus for breaking the Sabbath. And if we look down, I wanted, I wanted to cover this because it's a setup for what we're going to talk about today as we continue in John chapter 5. So we're in John chapter 5. Let's start in verse um, 15. And I'll read the next few verses here. And then we'll start the passage we'll cover today is maybe 19 through 29. So in verse 15, it says, The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this is why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father is working until now, and I am working. Well, now they're extra mad. And how mad are they? In verse 18, it says, This is why the Jews were seeking all the more 
to kill him because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Well, that seems like a real, um, <coughs> sorry, I have the dry throat. That seems like a real, um, maybe over the top reaction for somebody to say, well, I'm equal with God and them go, well, then we should kill you. Where, where do they get that? It's not just that they're mad. Let's, I want you to keep a, a, keep a finger in John chapter five and let's rewind way back to the Old Testament, to the book of Leviticus. Leviticus is one of the first five books of the Old Testament written by Moses. This is part of what we call the Pentateuch. You think five books, Penta, that's kind of where they get that, the Pentateuch. And in the Pentateuch is captured um, the, the law, what's called the law of Moses, the law given by God through Moses to teach the Israelites um, law and order and how to obey God. And so there's a story here that's a little wild, but it, it comes out as instruction. So like there's sort of a setup here where I'm in Leviticus chapter 24. We're going to start at verse 10. There's a little setup story here, and then they go to Moses, and they get some instruction on what should be done in situations like this. So um, let's see. Uh, I'll, I'm going to let you guys read. So Katie, you're first. If you'll read <clears throat> 10 through 12, that's that first paragraph. And then Alyssa, <coughs> if you'll finish uh, verses 13 through 16. Yeah, sorry, I had a chapter 24, and you said chapter 12 for Leviticus? No, Leviticus 24, verse oh, 10 through 12, okay. <laughs> and then Alyssa, if you'll finish that subheading, it's verse 13 through 16. Perfect, thank you. Okay, um, so punishment for blasphemy. Now an Israelite woman's son, whose father was an Egyptian, went out among the people of Israel, and the Israelite woman's son and a man of Israel fought in the camp. And the Israelites, Israelites' woman's son blasphemed the name and cursed. Then they brought him to Moses. His mother's name was Shilobeth, the daughter of Debri, of the tribe of Dan. And they put him in custody till the will of the Lord should be clear to them. Then the Lord said to Moses, Take the blasphemer outside the camp. All those who heard him are to lay their hands on his head, and the entire assembly is to stone him. Say to the Israelites, anyone who curses their God will be held responsible. Anyone who blasphemes the name of the Lord is to be put to death. The entire assembly must stone them. Whether foreigner or native born, when they blaspheme the name, they are, they are to be put to death. I'm still muted. I muted because I was coughing loud. Um, so where, where did they get this anger unto wanting to kill Jesus for blaspheming? In their minds, blaspheming the name of God? Well, they got it straight out of the law. This isn't them making up some new punishment for something they were mad about. They're, they're recalling this passage in Leviticus that if you blaspheme the name of the Lord, you shall surely be put to death. Well, why does God give this instruction here? It should bring to our minds um, an, an obvious importance that he places on his name, that his name is to be regarded as the summary of who he is, his holiness, his righteousness, his perfection. And somebody who's allowed to go around cursing his name in, in, in this day and age, when Moses was writing, was to be put to death as a sign of respect for the name of God. And that's what, they're, that's what they're calling back to. And so they're thinking, remember, I want us to draw a difference between their perception of what Jesus has done and what Jesus has actually done. In their minds, they're viewing Jesus as just a man. Oops. Sorry, technology's hard. There we go. As just a man. And so if he was just a man and said, God is my personal, special, particular father, just me, 
not generally father of the Israelite nation or of the world as he created it, but I have a special one-on-one -on -one familiar relationship with him. He's putting himself on equal footing with God and their minds. That's blasphemous. That's saying that you're God is what they're saying. What in actuality happened is Jesus spoke the truth about who he is. That's not blasphemy. So what does he do here? They make this accusation, we need to kill him because he's made himself equal with God. And he could have done a number of things here. But what he did was he reiterated and strengthened the point that he just made about being co-equal with God. So that's the part we're going to read now in John chapter 5. So turn back to John chapter 5 with me. We're going to read verses 19 through 29. Matt, if you'll read 19 through 24, and then I'll read 25 through 29. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. But the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these will he show him, so that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself, as he has given him authority to execute judgment, because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this. For an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, those who have, who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. So to start off here, I want us to just, as you, as you heard those verses, as you read those verses, what are some of the words that got repeated multiple times? Because those are the words we're going to be talking about over the next few minutes. Really, truly. Truly, truly. Good job. What else? The word life. Father. Sorry. Life. Good. What'd you say, Matt? Son and father. Son and father. Good. Judgment. One more. One more I'm looking for. Who said that? The judgment. Judgment. Excellent. All right judgment. Okay, so these are the themes for this passage. We're, we're going to see the son's relationship to the father. We're going to see that expressed through the idea of life and the giving of life, and we're going to see that expressed through authority to judge and judgment carried out. And all of this, Jesus continues to use that phrase that he likes to use when he's saying, pay attention, I'm about to lay on you some very true material. He says, truly, truly, multiple times. So let's start up here at the top in verse 19. Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. Or some translations you'll see in like manner. Um, here, notice what he's done. In, in back in verse 17, it was first person. He said, My Father and I. And here in 19, he's switched to third person, the father and the son. He doesn't get back to first person until he gets down to verse 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word. So here he's talking sort of objectively about the relationship between the son and the father. And he's taken the very thing that they were most concerned about, that he was making himself equal with God, and he's saying, yeah, the son is equal with the father. They are on the same footing here, that the father is first in order of, um, how do I put this, in, in the order of the Godhead, that the son is eternally begotten of the father, but they have that same 
substance, that same divine essence. So here he says, the sun can do nothing. The sun can do nothing uh, of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. There's this, uh, this is not like an inherent inability for him to do things. This is more of a moral inability to do something that God cannot do. So give me some examples of some things God, because he is God who is good and righteous and sinless, what are some of the things God cannot do? Cannot sin. He cannot sin. Good. We could even give some examples of that. Like he can't, uh, he can't lie. He can't steal. He can't, um, you know, it, it, any number of things there. I love the question, you know, can, can God make a rock so big he can't lift it? And then no. they try to use that. <laughs> no, he can make a rock as big as he wants to, and he can lift the rock. But neither of those are like, that's like a tautology. That's, that's like saying God can do what he can do. That's not saying that there's things God can't do. Absolutely, there's things God can't do. He can't do anything that's contrary to his nature. Well, let me ask you something. Who can do these things? Who can sin? Who can lie? Who can steal? Who can Humanity. do those things? Humans can do this. Man can do this. Men and women can do this. If the son can do nothing of his own accord except what he sees the father doing, that means he can't do this. So what has he just told them about himself? That the son is what? Perfect. Son well, he's God. perfect. Good. I'm looking for this word. If he can't do the things that only creatures can do, then he's not a creature. He's a creator. He is God. And so here, if, if you just read this at first glance and, you, and it says, well, the son can do nothing unless the father, he sees the father doing it. The, the point of that is really not to say um, that Jesus is subservient to the father. What it is to say is that they're of one accord in their will. They're in this game together. They're in lockstep. A lot of times, um, and, and I think the person that I saw give that picture, this picture first, was that he, I think it was Sinclair Ferguson, and he said, uh, you know, I used to have this picture, and a lot of people have this picture, that here's God, the Father, standing here with his fist raised up like this, ready to just punch you in the mouth when you sin. And then along comes Jesus, who steps in front of the Father and goes, no, Dad, be nice. These guys are with me. We need to love them. And that image puts Jesus and Father in opposition to each other. But that's not the case. That, that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are in one mind in this act of salvation. That when we're saved from the wrath of God, it was God the Father who purposed it. He, he planned it from the beginning. It was God the Son who uh, accomplished it in the fullness of time. And it's God, the Holy Spirit, who applies it um, when each new believer is converted and become a child of God. And so they work in unison in that respect. And so he's just, he's just reiterating here what the Jews were actually mad about. Yes, the Son is co-equal here with the Father on the same footing. Now, in verse 20, he says, For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. Um, this is a follow-up on the point he just made, that the son can, can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. Here, we see that the father loves the son and manifests that love by showing him these works. That's way too many Gs. Okay, showing him these works. That's the manifest, manifestation of his love. And this is where it gets really good. He says, and greater works than these will he show him. 
What works was he referring to there? Viggies. The healing that he just performed. Bingo. Very good. This is all in the context of the healing that had just happened. So the, when it says these, he's referring to this act of healing on the Sabbath. And um, there's an E there. And he says, greater works than these will he show him so that you may marvel. In other words, so that you will pay attention and see what's going on and wonder about that and marvel at it. So then he goes on to give two specific examples of works that the Father will show him so that you may marvel. The first is in verse 21. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. So we see this giving of life is the first one. And we'll, I want to, we'll, we'll look at some examples in just a second, but that's number one. I'll write number two over here so it's not behind me. Um, and then in verse 22, for the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son. So the second here is judgment. And these are the two things that the Father is giving to the Son as an extension of who he is and what he's already doing. The, the Son will accomplish these things to his own glory and honor and praise. So I want us to look at some examples here um, that, you know, if we think of God giving life, God created all life. He breathed life into Adam. Adam did not have life until God breathed it in him. Um, we also saw a, examples in the Old Testament of Elijah and Elisha, both healing dead people, like the, the bringing the dead back to life. And Jesus does the same thing. The biggest example we'll see later in uh, the book of John is in John chapter, I think it's 10 or 11, when he brings um, Lazarus back to life. But that's not the only one. I want us to see an example here and turn with me to the book of Mark. Keep a finger in John chapter 5 and turn one book back, two books back, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, two books back, to Mark chapter 5. In Mark chapter 5, we're going to see an example of Mark. Mark's a different kind of writer than John. Mark likes to start a story, insert a story into the middle of that story, and then finish the story after. Um, that's just something that Mark does. He uses these like transition stories to get from one place to another. And we're going to see an example of that here in Mark chapter 5, verse 21. What I have not been doing is uh, writing my references up here. Um, I don't remember where we were in 25, but we're in, we're in Mark 5, and we're going to start at 20, verse 21. Um, let's see, Katie, if you'll read verses 21 through 24, okay. and then we're just going to kind of skip this inner in-between story about the, the healing of the woman with the discharge of blood, um, and we'll, so we'll skip down and pick back up at verse 35, and so Alyssa, if you'll read 35 through 43. Jesus heals a woman and Jairus' daughter. And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly saying, my little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him. Good. Now let's skip to verse 35. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, why, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. 
After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said, Talitha Koum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. Very good. So we see here, even before his resurrection, even before we see um, many raised to life, and this is even prior to him bringing Lazarus, who was dead for three days in the tomb, back out of the tomb, um, we see an example here of Jesus having the power of life in him, that God, um, how does it put it? I want to I read it just the right way. Um, in verse... 26 of John chapter 5. He says, For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. So here, this giving of life is one of these ways, one of these um, uh, works that God's given for the Son to do, the Father has given for the Son to do, so that the Son would be given honor and praise and glory. So the second of these is judgment. We see a reference to him as judge in verse 22, um, and then we see the word judgment again in 24, and we'll, we'll, I'll go back through these in just a minute. And then we see that again in 27. He has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the son of man. Now, I like that he put that in there because that's, that's going to give us a, a reference to refer back to who remembers why why. Does Jesus like to call himself the Son of Man? That's not just saying, um, I'm fully God and fully man. This Son of Man title is from the Old Testament. And who remembers where that was from? We covered it several weeks ago, briefly. So if you don't, that's okay. But I wanted to ask and see if anybody remembered. Daniel 7. Daniel 7. Is that in your notes or did you remember? Notes. <laughs> okay, that's an acceptable answer. I'm a note taker, so that's perfect. All right, Daniel chapter 7. So let's turn to Daniel chapter 7, and this time it's going to be Matt's turn to read. And I need more bookmarks in my Bible because I didn't have it bookmarked. Daniel chapter 7, Daniel is given, Daniel is a prophet in the Old Testament during the exile of uh, the Jews into Babylon, and he was given favor um, with the kings of Babylon because God gave him the ability to interpret dreams and to prophesy the future. Well, one of these prophecies here in Daniel chapter 7 is given to him in a, a dream of his own in the night he's given visions. So Matt, if you'll read for us Daniel chapter 7 verses 9 and 10, and then also read 13 and 14. As I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousands served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man, and he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Very good. So here, when it says Ancient of Days, who is that referring to? That's referring to God. It's referring to God. Specifically, I would say it's referring to God the Father in this picture. Because there's also Son of Man who is brought before him. And who's that referring to? The Son. That's the Son. And so here Jesus is, especially in this claim of being given authority to judge, he's using the term Son of Man to point us back to this passage in Daniel chapter 7, where it says that it's not, it doesn't just mean that he was born a man, 
it means that he's the one that God will give dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. Well, what does that judgment end up looking like? Well, let's flip to a book that's all about that, all the way at the end of your Bible, the book of Revelation. Okay, we're going to go to Revelation chapter 19. Who remembers who wrote the book of Revelation? John. John did. I think we've studied a book by a guy named John. Oh, yeah, that's that guy. It's the same guy, but um, he, he writes the book of Revelation, which, by the way, in the Greek is Apocalypto. Um, uh, apocalypto. I'm going to misspell that. That's where we get the word apocalypse. Um, you know, you, you watch movies on TV. This is an apocalyptic movie, and it just means the end of the world. That's not what it meant in Greek. It just meant revelation, that this is the revelation of God through John to tell us about what was to come. So in John chapter 19, let's look at verses 11 through 16. And I guess it's my turn to read. Um, this is a picture of Jesus. This is a picture of the Son. But this is not Jesus meek and mild that we see on pictures on the wall um, or those kinds of things. This is a different kind of picture of Jesus. One who is coming like a son of man and I'll just let the text speak for itself here. In Revelation 19, verse 11, Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. It's another name for crown. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. That should sound familiar. In verse 14, And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Wow. I think it's good sometimes to read something like that and just let it soak in. I feel a little bit like Mr. Rogers saying something like that. Sometimes it's good to just be quiet and let it soak in. Um, this is not the picture that we frequently have of Christ, but this is the same person. This is the eternal Logos returning, not as a Savior, but as judge and king. So when he says, flip back with me to John chapter 5, he continues to draw contrast in his role as the Son and his relationship with the Father between his two-part roles of giving life and judgment. That this, these are both things that Jesus has the ability to do. These are both parts of what his role is as the son of the father. So let's continue to read. And I want us to, I'm just going to reread again here to the end. And us continue to see these parallels, these, these two things opposed against each other as we read. So let's see, um, in verse 22, for the father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the son, that all may honor the son just as they honor the father. Whoever does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For the Father has life in himself, so he has uh, granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection 
of judgment. So we see over and over examples given of life and judgment, and I want you guys to listen for me. So um, let's see, starting in verse 23, we get an example of those who the Son gives life. What do they do? Those who give life, what do they do for the Son? Honor him. They honor him. They honor him. It's interesting to me that the Jews who said Jesus, who compared himself to the Father by saying, my Father is working until now, and I am working, in their minds he's blaspheming. And he's saying here that whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. He's saying that they were blaspheming by saying that Jesus was not God. We even talk about turning the tables here. So the opposite here, I'd put over here under judgment, is those who do not honor. And how do we know that? It's in the next verse. I say that whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me his eternal life, does that belief, uh, whoever believes him, and how did he get there? It says he passed, uh, he does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. So if believing is how you're granted life, how are you granted judgment instead? Uh, you remain in death. You remain in death. You remain in unbelief. Yeah. So um, as we continue here, we see that the Father has life in himself. Let's, say, let's, let's back up to verse 25. It says something will happen, and those who, he says, when the dead will hear the voice of God, and how do those who are dead live? I'm not asking this very well. In verse they 25, we, know, we see another example. Yeah, he, they hear him. They hear him. And it's not just, oh, I heard it happen. There's a, there's a response there. Like if I call your name, but you keep walking away from me, that's not what it's talking about here. This is a, this is a voice of God calling out and there's a response. Okay. This is hearing and responding. I, I, this, especially this passage right here, it says that an hour is coming and is now here. In other words, this is partially going to be expressed in the future, and this is partially expressed already right now. Well, how do the dead hear right now and are given life? How does that come up? Well, here he's not talking about actual people who are dead. Who's he talking about? He's talking about living people who okay. are still dead in sin. They're still dead in their sins. That's right. They're dead in sin and trespasses. And upon hearing the gospel, hearing the call of God, they respond and they pass from death to life. That they're given that new abundant life now. Um, the, you know, you've, you've probably heard of the TV show, The Walking Dead. That's every non-believer that's ever lived. The, the Bible calls us dead in sin. Um, so, those who hear and respond then um, uh, will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he's granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he's given him authority to execute judgment. And then there's another example given here in verse 28. This is the future. That was the present part of this. Then here's this future part. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Now, I want to point something out here. This says all will come out. Are there some who are not going to be resurrected? No. That means that every person that's ever lived, ever been born, or is currently living, when they die, will be resurrected. 
but there's a distinction made here. There are two kinds of resurrection here. What are they? It's a resurrection to life and a resurrection to judgment. A resurrection to life and a resurrection to judgment. And what's the difference between the two? Well, one was those who did good, and one was those who did evil. Good. And so if you just took that one verse, and you took it out, and you threw away the whole Bible, okay, what would you think if I said, if you do good, when you die, you'll be resurrected and go to heaven? You'd probably go, yeah, sure. I better start go volunteering at the food pantry. <laughs> Right, I better start doing good things so I can go to heaven. And I better not do bad things because I might go to hell. All right, well, we don't throw away the whole Bible. We have the whole Bible to explain this one verse to us instead. In fact, we have just this one passage to explain this verse to us. Those who do good, what, what does it mean by that? What are the good works it's talking about there? They are the good, the, the righteousness that Christ gives us through belief in him. Mm -hmm. Only those who believe can do good, first of all. And, and those, that good comes from Christ, not from us. So right. these, the, the resurrection of those who have done good were those who heard and believed. Very good. So what did you do? You just repeated these three things up here. This is what he's talking about when he says those who do good. It's those who honor the Son, and in doing so, honor the Father. It's those who hear the word of God, hear the words of the Son, and believe and have eternal life in his name. It's those who are dead in sin and hear the voice of God and respond, and they will live. That's what it means by those who do good. And what does it mean by those who do evil? Those who do not hear, who do not respond, who remain dead in their sins. Very good. That's this part over here. Those who do not honor, those who remain in unbelief. And, um, and, and so what he's doing here is he's arguing, he's, he's continuing to argue his sonship with the Father and his deity. Because he's been given these, this two-part role to give life to whom he will, which it says um, in plain words in verse 21, so also the Son gives life to whom he will, and to pass out judgment to those who remain in unbelief. Well, there's, there's something that I, I want to point out here. We've talked about how in verse 19, he couldn't do anything but what he saw the Father doing in other words, he can't do those things that the Father doesn't do. So he's not a creature. He's a creator. By the same token, when it says he gives life to whom he will, this speaks of his sovereignty. Twofold here. One in the respect of whom, and also the fact that he wills it. Okay, he's sovereign over the whom that he gives life to, and he's sovereign in that it's his own will that's driving the giving of life. There's a distinction here between his ability to give life and the Old Testament prophets who raised the dead to life. They were given power by God to do that according to God's purpose and will, by his instruction and, and his direction. And here, Jesus does it of his own accord because he is God and he's sovereign to do it of his own power. So he's greater than just another prophet who's sent by God and has the power to do some of these works. He is the creator. He is co-equal with God in substance. God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit are three in person, one in essence. And he's also sovereign over his ability to give life. He does not depend on somebody else to give him that power. That power is within himself, 
and by his own will. Well, that's where he, he finishes up here at the end of verse 29. That's not the end of his conversation with these Jews, however. So we're going to continue to study that next week. But we'll pause here for now. We'll, get, we'll have some time to, for, for questions and things like that. I think it'll come up later on in John, and he doesn't go into it. Jesus doesn't go into it here, but uh, another emphasis and reminder that he and the Father are one comes, uh, well, in a couple of places, but later on in the high priestly, high priestly prayer, where he makes it clear that, like you're saying, Jesus has the authority to give life to whom he will, and he gives life to those whom the Father has given him. And so there's this unity in in will, this reinforcing of of the idea that these are not two gods these are not two separate complete distinct entities um but we they are presented you know he is presented in in multiple persons but they share a unity of of will absolutely we see uh glimpses here in this conversation and many more to come that in God sending the Son in the likeness of flesh to save sinners, ultimately the goal of the Father was to bring glory and honor to the Son. And, and that, was, that was the whole point. Like that The point of, of all of this was out of the Father's love for the Son. That the reason why he created the earth and the reason why he created men and women even in an unstable state who would fall morally and need saving, they would need redeeming. The whole purpose of that was to bring a redeemed people and present it to the son as a love gift from the father. And that the son would go and accomplish that work and bring them back with him to the father that all of this is this love and unity between the three persons of the Godhead. That they're not in opposition to each other. They're actually all accomplishing the same work. They're just taking on different roles in the process. But yeah, you're right. That's going to keep coming up, especially in the Gospel of John. Other thoughts? Now, I know some of you take notes, so you must have taken notes about something. What you take notes about? Um, well, I was just going to say that this is a, a portion of scripture that I, had I been reading it on my own, um, because of the, the words that are repeating themselves over and over again, I probably would have sort of skimmed over it mm -hmm. um, and, and kind of gotten what I thought would be the gist of it and kept going. Um, so really slowing down and breaking down verse by verse was really, really helpful for me. And um, just this last portion of our conversation and what we've been talking about reminds me so much of Romans 9 when Paul talks about God's sovereignty and um, just about how, like, I, I truly believe that your view of this completely, uh, like, shapes your view of God mm -hmm. and, and who he is and how he works. Mm -hmm. If you, if you ignore this part of him, then you're basically ignoring all of him. You know, you have to come to terms with that part, I think, mm -hmm. and, and like fully under, you know, try your best to understand it. So um, anyway, I thought it was really good. Excellent. Very good. This is helpful for me too. Um, again, I'm new to this, maybe not as much as I was when I first started, but I always struggled with understanding, oh, wait, is Jesus God and is God Jesus? So hearing what Matt just touched upon is really helpful and that there are no separate entities and, you know, God is working. Um, it's like a unity. So I'm still trying to wrap my head around it, but that's really helpful. And I look forward to the other chapters in John on hearing more of that. And like Alyssa shared, um, when Chris and I read um, at night, we don't really take notes like this and maybe we're skimming over things and 
it makes me want to go back and see what I could have missed. Um, so these are really helpful just jotting down. And like Alyssa said, I wouldn't have ever caught the repetition of judgment and um, other words, uh, maybe just truly, truly, but not like life and judgment. So it's really helpful to jot that down and see the hidden meanings and, and references in the past and you in the future. Sure. Yeah. So if you succeed in wrapping your mind around the Trinity, then you're on much better footing than me. Okay. Because <laughs> um, the idea of God being one in essence, but three in persons is so foreign to who we are because we're like mind and body and it's all one piece. It, there's not like, we can't be three per, I can't be three persons and three and, and also one in essence. But that's who God is, and that's who he's revealed himself to be. Um, and theologians since forever have always gone, you know, every time I think about the Trinity, I think about the one. And every time I think about the one, I think about the Trinity. And it's like, where do you land? And you just don't. Um, this is something that, like, that we talk about and we have words for, but it's hard to wrap our minds around. Um, but, yeah, the idea that they're not, you know, can you pray individually to the three persons in the Godhead? You bet. They're persons. You can talk to them. Uh, does it mean you're talking to different gods? Nope. Same God. So that's where, like, you know, I, when you pray, is it appropriate to pray to the Holy Spirit? For sure. Um, it's the same God, right? So, and then the second is, um, when I first read this passage to study for it this week, I went, Wow, this is yet another example of Jesus being really confusing when he talks, okay? And so, like, when you say, if I read this, I'd have just skipped over it, so would I. Because uh, if, if, if you think John can shove some doctrine into some really dense wording, Jesus is even better at it. And this is an example of that. And so I've, um, our, our pastor wrote a book on expository preaching. And one of the points that he makes in during the, like the, the sermon prep portion of it is that when you prepare for a sermon or to teach a lesson, you need to read the passage and then you need to read the passage and then you need to read the passage. And he said, 30 times would be a good minimum. He says, but I like to read it 50 times. And I'm going in one week, you read that passage 50 times. And he really does. Like, he's just, he's just that good. That's what he does. He's, God's gifted him with the ability to preach in an expository faction, to, to just open the scriptures and teach what's there. Um, and so I've tried to do that more when I teach. Don't just go look for all the other verses that help support it. Really stay in the passage and continue to read it. And that's helped me this week, especially on this passage, because it was hard. It was the wording, the repetition, and then we see like third person, first person. How does that interact? What, why is he doing that? So um, I would say, you know, if you get to a point and you go, I have no clue what Jesus is talking about. Put it down, come back the next day and just read it again. And then put it down and come back the next day and read it again. And, um, and just pray that the Holy Spirit would help you to understand it over time. That, that's, that's the only thing I would say to recommend on that. Cool. Well, we're over time, but I've thoroughly enjoyed our time together. I'm so glad that, that all three of you came. Um, how about I'll turn off the recording and, um, and we'll pray.